Well, it, it's it's not that I have anything to say at all, really. But it's 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 the act of writing uh, in itself uh, that I. It, it, it's such a big part of my life that I just couldn't couldn't leave it. And I didn't mean to leave it for good writing, but I thought writing novels, being a novelist, being that kind of author, I just wanted to get out of. And that was also the plan of from the beginning with my struggle. I want to write everything, so there shouldn't be anything left to tell, you know. And you have this notion, you learn this, that there is some sort of, I don't know what it is in English, but some sort of sort, some sort of uh, center, some sort of uh, essence that everyone has. That, that's your story that you shouldn't write about, but you should you know where write from. And I thought, well, I just want to mention everything, absolutely everything, let it lay it bare. And then I thought, yeah, there isn't anything else to write about. And it was also a way out of my struggle because it was an ending. It was a definite ending. And this project was kind of huge and and but I knew I had kind of a you know it was light out there I could escape through that tunnel uh, and I did and I, and I and I really wanted not to write novels or anything like it anymore I thought maybe I could, you know I could write criticism and essays and and stuff uh, and then like a few months later I started a novel and it was uh, crap. I wrote 30 pages or something. And I just put it aside. And then I did a lot of other books. And then I started a series of novels. So there was Morningstar. And then when I started this book, The Wolves of Eternity, I didn't know where to begin, didn't know where to go. And I went through all my stuff and all my... Because I, I never threw anything away. I keep everything. And then I found this story that I started just after my struggle with a with a young man coming home from from the army uh, to his brother and mother, and I read it. And I I was so embarrassed when I wrote it; I didn't, didn't even show it to my editor. He reads absolutely everything. But then I thought, now that now this is something you know, this is kind of has a freshness to it. It's it's very different from the other stuff I've been writing. And I really like the character. He's, you know, he's a simple young man, but but there was something to him. And then I thought, okay, this is the beginning of this book, and it ended up being the Wolves of Eternity. So, so there is, a, yeah, I have never done something like that before. I had thirty pages, I read it, and I couldn't, you know, even recognize myself in it. And then I just continued, and and that's the book. Okay, so the thirty pages that you wrote and discarded are the 30 pages that you later went back to is what you're saying. That's the opening me. of this book, yeah. And it's it's uh, it's not edited. It's it's how it it's how it was written then. And then I just thought it was this is so this is horrible. I just put it aside and then I thought this time I maybe I could elaborate a bit and see because there was something in the basic situation I really liked, I think. It was the the sense of landscape and the sense of atmosphere and the time you know it's the 80s when i was a teenager and it's the relations in the family because there's a little family it's uh, him the main character he's 19 20 and his little and brother is, his name is uh, forgive me on the pronunciation Sievert Leuning. Uh, he's called Sievert Leuning, yeah and he has a little very bright little brother uh, and the father is dead and the mother is uh some kind of she's a bit distant to him he, he, she's closer to his little brother so there is some some sort of family dynamic and it was such a relief to write about an easygoing person he's social so sociable he's uh, he's uh, he's not you know uh, um, he's a happy young man really with lust for life and and I could, through him, uh, write about football, which I've never done, which I l really love, and I loved playing. And and that's a novel to me, you know, a, a, a young man, 19, playing football in the autumn when it's raining and it's dark, and it's that's that's the that's where the novel is, in in my well, head. Yeah, and I want to get to it because like you're so great at writing about what I guess people would call the everyday, and yet making it super compelling and interesting 
it's kind of the magic of your work because in the hands of a lesser writer, I don't think that sort of thing works or, or doesn't work as well. Uh, but before we get there, I want to read to you some things that have been written, I believe, about your work or have been written by you about your approach to the work. So uh, there's an essay that I believe you wrote about your editor, who you mentioned a bit ago. And again, forgive yeah. me on the pronunciation, but it's Gear. Yeah, Gear, yeah. Yeah, Gear Gullickson, I believe is, is yeah. his name. And you, yeah, that's his name, you, yeah. You say, in almost everything I have written, there is a longing for boundaries. Okay, so that's one thing that you've said. And then yeah. in, in, an essay, in an essay that you wrote about the American photographer Sally Mann, you write, I long to be free, totally free in yeah. art. And this to mm -hmm. me is to be without politics, without morals. And then I have another quote written down here, and it might be from Gear. Uh, I, don't, I forgot to attribute it, but it says, it's striking how much of Karl Ova's life has been spent auditioning routes to freedom. So we have some statements here that are kind of mm. contradictory. There's like this longing for boundaries and this desire to be totally free in art. The, the question I have is like, which is it? Yeah. <laughs> or is it somehow both? No, it's, it's yeah, no, it, it is really both. Um, I think... Um, well... If if I look at my life and my writing, so so in in my twenties, I think my life was very chaotic. Um, I am as a person kind of very, I'm shy and and kind of restricted in any social setting, and and but also with a kind of an, an enormous monologue going and a kind of a, a inner inner world that never was was um, expressed in any way it's like it's like uh you know enormously self-aware and and so in in drinking those kind of things uh, that i that i i really loved it, it, because it's freed me but it was also very chaotic and at, at times felt you know dangerous looking back on it and at that time when i was in that chaotic state my writing was very poor it was like it was like nothing of what i had inside was possible to to get on the page it was like it wasn't anything it was, you know it was it was only form and form is boundaries you know so so i think the switch there was with boundaries in my my own life and 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 trying to to get out of that and be free in the writing and uh, so there is a constant dynamic between life and personality and writing and 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 things but but um i actually never got that question before but yeah it, it feels like so when i'm writing now i am it's incredibly I follow rules, you know, it, it's at the same time, it's the same way, I play the same music, so everything is f focused on uh, on boundaries and safety and, and security and nothing, you know, can or should happen. So so that the, 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 I feel safe enough to <laughs> transgress in, in my writing. Uh, there, is, there is a connection somehow, but um, yeah. I do, I've always liked rituals. I always liked uh, those kind of those kind of things. Um, um, you know, I've, I remember when my father died. Uh, I've been writing a lot about that. But but the, the 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 sense of chaos and 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 like absolutely no control, just 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 and very destructive. And then the the actual funeral the 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 ritual was almost it was like it's contained it you know and that's uh, that's kind of an emotion i've had or a feeling i've had throughout my life that it need to be contained but in the writing that shouldn't 
that shouldn't happen. That's that's where all all the, that kind of energy, also the destructive energy, should be channeled. In my case, I mean, I'm not talking about rules for, <laughs> for any other writer. Well, it's like there's somebody. I'm gonna botch it. There was somebody, some famous writer of your. I want to say it was Flaubert. Somebody who said something to the effect of orderly in life chaotic on the page. I think that's kind of what you're saying is that you have to have these rituals and these boundaries in your life so that you can be boundary less in your writing. Yeah, because it's about uh, uh, to be free, you know, uh, in writing, I mean. Uh, and that's uh, has always been in incredibly important. The, the moment I, 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 you know, started to write something that was worth something that was kind of i'm not saying it was good but it has a value in itself that that was stuff i you know couldn't have thought up i couldn't have made it up it was just something that happened in the process of writing where it's the whole point is being free from yourself and 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 just being kind of selfless and then a lot of stuff can happen mm. And form could be a help, of course. So I also always have some sort of rules or some sort of system that everything goes into. Um, in, but that's in a kind of a... a pro, that helps the, the, the direction, more or less. So if you just sit down, you don't know what to write. There's nothing inside of you. It's like there's nothing. It's just a blank page, then you need something, you know? So you need some sort of direction or some sort of thought about some kind of, of yeah, of form or, or, or whatever that could could bring you there. Um, yeah, that's very abstract talking about it, but More I know what I'm talking about. I don't think I can <laughs> express it very well. No, no, well, I'm going to read you another line uh, because you spoke to this just a second ago. And I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about it because you said, quote, when I was about 27, I changed my language. This is difficult to explain. You can write a radical Norwegian or a conservative Norwegian. And when I changed to a conservative Norwegian, I gained this distance or objectivity in the language. The gap released something in me. <coughs> and in the writing... And in the writing, which made it possible for the protagonist to think thoughts, I had never myself thought. So this is connected to what we're discussing, correct? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's. Um... But what is radical Norwegian or conservative Norwegian? That's the part of it that I don't quite get. Is that something to do with the, the language? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, that is a complex uh, story, but. Uh... I can try to make it simple. Um, so no, I was was under Danish rule for 400 years. So the official written Norwegian was Danish. So Henrik Ibsen wrote Danish, Knut Thomsen wrote Danish. And then at the end of 18th century, mid end of 18th century, there was a, a made by one called Ivar Rosen. He, he was the man behind it, made a, uh, another language based on dialects which is new norwegian it's very similar but it's it it's it was very important because of the the, the you know the feeling of of um, your own culture your own nation and and so on and so forth um so when i grew up my mother wrote new norwegian my father wrote Danish that had been moderated to what's called bookmål, uh, which is more conservative and, and more official in a way. Um, and then you have all kind of uh, levels in between. Uh, so you can write, if you write more radical, bookmål, which is Danish, is closer to Nynorsk, but it still is. And that was connected to politics and to you know to social status and all kind of stuff uh, just by the way you wrote and when I was a teenager I was very much 
left, I thought of myself as an anarchist or, you know, it was, it was all of that. And, and when I was writing, I, I wrote in a very, very much like I was talking and very, it was very much me. It's very much connected to my identity. That was how I, this is who I am. This is how I write. And it was the same thing. And when I changed to some sort of very conservative writing, it wasn't me anymore. And then I could start to pour in whatever I had inside in this slightly different, slightly distanced form. And then something come back and then something else turned up. And then and that was writing. That was what writing was. When it, it wasn't me. It was a, a kind of an interaction with something that happened in between me and the writing. And it, it was a revelation for me because I... I could write, you know, it was like the whole point of it was that I saw something on the page that wasn't me, that I couldn't have thought up, that was just different. It was, you know, it was literature. And then even in, in you know, in, in my struggle, I did this, let go of myself or, or my own opinion. So just follow the text and see what happened, you know, and, and, and in this new project, that's the, that's what it is about, trying to, it's exactly the same mechanism, really. Uh, you, I enter some person that's not me and write and fills that person with me, of course, but it's not me. The opinion is not mine, the, the way of thinking. You know, it's of course it is me, but it is it has something else and that's a motor in, 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 in the writing. That's how things comes into being, really. So if I if I didn't have that distance, I wouldn't ha because I don't have anything to say. You know, um, um, when I'm dinner parties, I don't say anything. I think what I have to say is stupid. It's not worth anything, and I, don't, I prefer not to say anything. Uh, and and it's not that I don't <laughs> I don't have anything, but when I'm writing, there is something that belongs to the process of writing, and I, I'm I'm just discovered that when I was. First time when I was 19 and, and then it disappeared and the second time when I was, you know, and that was it for real. That was when I was 27 and, and yeah, and I, I never knew that I could or that there was something. And that's why I say to everyone who asks me for advice, you know, it's, it's just, it's if, you know, just sit and write and write and write and write and something will happen because it's not you, it's, it's the, in the process, you know, so if you, if you believe in, in that, and that's very hard to believe it if there's no result, you know, uh, then then something will, will turn up. That's interesting. I'm trying to think if there's a corollary in like American English. It seems like you, like this, this distance, this necessary distance that you achieved by taking on a more formal approach with the language. Yeah. I've never, I've never had, I've never had a conversation with an author who did that before. You're the first person who's done that, but maybe it's specific to Norwegian history and the history of the Norwegian language. But it's just interesting that this more formalized language gave you access to your chaotic inner self. But I also sort of understand how the tension between those two things could be productive. You know, sometimes it takes this kind of tension in order for somebody to open up. I mean, it certainly sounds like it's the case with you. And I want to ask you about this new novel of yours, uh, The Wolves of Eternity, which is, I believe, and I think you said this earlier, the second in a series. And yeah. you, just completed the you just completed the third book. In the no, series, the fourth. The, f the fourth. Oh, my God. So, okay, so yeah, it's, there's, it's the been... there's the Morning Star, and yeah. then Wolves of Eternity... Yeah, and then there's one called uh, in, yeah, it would be like something like the third kingdom, which is the third. And then the fourth is called, if I translate, the night school. So uh, my goal or my aim is to write one novel each year till this series, <laughs> the story is told. Uh, so I've, I've done it four years now and it's four books, so. It's uh, starting to become a sort of rhythm. Um, so in yeah, these days uh, the manuscript is it's the very last stages. So we we printed uh, in two weeks. 
Wow. Okay. So, but let's talk about, for the purposes of this conversation, the Wolves of Eternity. Yeah, which, of course. Which follows the Morning Star. And, you know, as we're talking about, this is another series. You seem to write books in series. This is, this is what you do. I mean, you tell these longer, longer stories that take multiple books to unfold. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's due to a lack of something, I think, because if, if I, if, when I write, if I write a hundred pages, there is, there is nothing, you know, there's nothing there. It's just some sort of description of something, but it's, it's like, it's nothing. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm writing, unfolding this things very slowly for some reason. So, and it, and it has been that always. And I, I think it has to do with, I always try to be present. Uh, so it's, I, I find it very hard to write the next two years. She, you know, did this and that. And then it's always like, it's gonna be, if I start like that, next page is gonna be minute by minute and then she opened door, do, 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 and then, and then, so, so the the kind of um, the arc that's over it is is almost invisible. So it's, it takes a long time to move it forward, uh, and, and it's not something I want. I mean, I want presence, but it's like I can't get out of it. So I thought with this character Sivert, he comes with a bus, and then you know I have to describe the fucking bus ride to you know for, for like three pages and then there is a house and then what's got happened there they're saying this and that and 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 then then eventually he goes to bed and then he walks up next day and what, what what's does it yeah he takes a shower and he goes down for breakfast and i have to tell everything so the advantage is that you get very close to something um and and so and and there is a presence but the, the disadvantage is that it took me 400 pages to tell the story about him or, or, or to kind of be able to leave him. And that was never ever the plan. It was the plan to do the same as in Morningstar. Then there are like 30 pages or 40 pages and then another character and then another character. But it's, it's um, it was so slowly this time. It took me, it took me 400 pages and nothing is really going on. Okay, but see the thing, we, I talked about this already, but this is something that your work is known for and is notable for, is the way in which you can be writing about quote unquote nothing, and yet it is so deeply compelling. How do you do that? <laughs> because lots of us could try to do something like this and the writing would be a disaster, it would be boring. So yeah, well, what that's is it process-wise? Well, I, I do think it's boring and, and, and I do struggle with that thought every day, you know, and I send the manuscript to my editor end of day, every day. And he replies in the morning just to be able to keep going. Um, so uh, when I do this kind of one novel a year, I have to write three pages a day, no matter what, really five days a week so that's that's how i treat it and 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 i never ever see anything big or huge or you know brilliant or anything because it's always kind of down in this on on bicycle on the on the road or to the local shop or i'm always in that i'm never in something big and it's it's incredibly demoralizing somehow for for my writing that's why i need my editor very very much to be kind of part of the process really um so i'm full of doubt always um but the 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 good thing or, 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 or the, what it does to the writing is that if you do that okay so so something must you know if 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 that's your life describing minute by minute some person uh there's always something coming up there's always something little, there's always something, always somewhere to go, you know, uh, either thought wise, there could be some thought of something. And that thought, maybe there is just what happened five years ago, could be important and could turn up later. And then there are many kind of things that start to roll and start to go small things, but then, then there is a story really. And that story makes itself just through 
what happens when you write about someone very slowly. There is things, it turns up and it leads you somewhere. And, and, and if there are many of those, it feels like it's, yeah, it feels like it's really full of action and there's a lot of things going on here. And, but it isn't, but, but it, the feeling is. And I guess that's kind of how it feels to be, you know, you would never think when you're on your own, alone, oh, I'm such a boring person. You always think I'm boring according or in relation to others or according to others. But when you are on your own, you won't think oh, I'm, 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 I'm boring. You could be bored, but you can't be boring. And, and that's basically, that's the place I'm writing from, I guess, where um, nothing is, you know, I'm not, there's nothing is boring in the writing really. But I'm afraid of being boring. Well, that's, but I think that's a healthy fear to have as a writer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I am actually, I mean, I know I am, but, but I can't help it. So I, I, it's either that or nothing. Do you have like, I mean, to be this productive and disciplined, you must have pretty good ability to focus. Are you good at concentrating? Like, is that a, a power that you have as an artist? Like, can you, you must really be able to lock in and, and focus on the work that you're doing to a degree that exceeds most of us because to write a novel a year, this is what an 800 something page novel. That's incredible yeah. output. Yeah, but it isn't really, it is, it is three pages a day. And if you do that throughout the year, you got that kind of amount of, of uh, I mean, some days it's more than, than that, but, but it's, uh, yeah, the, the, the hellish thing is of course, uh, if you have, I have five hours a day that I can write, uh, and then I don't want to write. So it's three hours of just not writing or I go and sleep a little bit more or do stuff. And then I have to do it. And, and then, uh, because it's, uh, it's such an effort to, to go in there. Uh, we have to stay in there for a few hours and, and then it's, then it's fine and it's done, but it's, um, I think it's my, my key to all of this was, I saw an interview with Ian McEwen many years ago and he used the expression selfless and I have stuck with that ever since that's what it is. And it is concentration of course, but it is also. I can only really compare it with reading. If you read something compelling, you disappear for yourself and, and time disappears and, and you are focused, you are concentrated, but it is somehow effortless. You could be exhausted afterwards, but you, you know, you want to, you want to be there. Uh, so there's no, there's nothing, there's nothing other than that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I find it incredibly hard to think, you know, if there is some mathematic thing or physics thing or, or, or anything or complex philosophy, or I'm, I'm, I'm so poor at it and I can't really, the effort it takes, it's too much for me. I can't do it. So, um, focusing on, on writing is different. It's like coming to a place and then, then you're there. It's hard to get there, but then you're there and, and it, you know, it's, it sounds like some, yeah, I don't like the sound of it because it's, it's nothing. It's just, it's just sitting down and writing, you know, it's nothing profound or anything about it, but it is an experience I have. And that's, I guess everyone who writes has that or everyone who, you know, make music or paint or, or do anything creative in any sense has to, has to disappear into that place. When it's going well, I think the access to it is the challenge for a lot of people, they might have days where it works, other days it doesn't work quite as well. I guess maybe the only way to become proficient at consistently losing yourself in the process and getting into what we would call here in the States, like a flow state, like a state of creative flow. The only way to really strengthen that part of yourself is to just practice, show up at the keyboard or show up at the page day after day after day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so when I started out writing, I was incredibly critical, self-critical. Um, so that meant I, I crippled myself. I couldn't write and then had my first novel. And then I started doing that again. So I was silent for five years and then another novel came 
and then I was silent for you know four more years uh, and and that in that last silent period I had 800 pages with beginnings you know that I that just scrapped and started over and over again because it was never good enough and what my writing my struggle learned me was that everything is good enough it is about accepting what's there and just go on and if you do that a novel will come out of it it could be good or it could be bad or most probably something in between but but still it's it's the it's the uh, lowering of the threshold so an acceptance of what whatever comes it's that's what it is and that's the day and that's 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 yeah there is this um, i think he's a genius he's he's a norwegian writer he's um like 10 years older than me uh, i mentioned in, in many interviews but he's not translated so you can't check him up but i i talked with him um even before i was a writer myself i think and he said that but you know you can use everything everything in your situation could be used for writing Every, if you just accept it even the fact that you can't write can be something you can write about you know everything goes just get something there and and continue and then uh he's he's absolutely brilliant but then when my first book came out we had a, a course of creative writing and and for two weeks together i was great fun but 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 what our aim was that we shouldn't remove anything from the text from the students it, it was all about continuation so that was that was that was uh, yeah that was kind of the central aspect of that course was just don't throw away anything don't don't stop just go on and and and, and that's what i'm trying in my own writing and and it's it's a double edged sword because it's also you know lower the quality and and but it 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 up the quantity and 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 something will always happen there will always be something interesting in it i mean if you do it that way who is this writer did you mention his name the one who gave you this i advice? didn't uh, of course i should uh, he published a novel uh, now in uh, in august that was absolutely brilliant uh, he's called tur erik lund but he's almost impossible to translate because his his everything is so you know um, grounded in his language it it will just disappear if if you translate him but i wish someone would try he's great so this level of abandon i think this is kind of what i mean this is the signature of the my struggle books and it's something that i think is uh, central to why so many people who read it responded so strongly is that you were able to achieve in the writing of those books a level of creative courage or abandon or surrender to the process that most writers understand is important but few writers can actually put into practice at that d level of intensity um, I, I guess like, you know, I feel like I'm going to ask this question knowing that the only answer is to just keep trying, <laughs> but it's like, how do you kind of trick yourself into letting go to that degree? You know what I'm saying? Like the inner critic is so yeah. persistent. That voice is yeah. so persistent, but you, you seem to have found a way to shut it off or to at least yeah. ignore it. Well, yeah. Uh, First of all, I I I needed help. I mean, I, I need still need a lot of help. But but I was surrounded by, especially my friend Geir. He not the editor, but the other one. I did the same thing. I read every word of my struggle on the phone to him while while writing, and he gave a lot of inputs. So and we had a discussion going. So it was like he opened a room where this happened. Um, and then my editor, who also read so it was like like a because it's 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 basically about you know uh, faith uh, and and yeah 
I can't read it now. I can't look back. I can see all the you know, weaknesses and all the poor things and all the shortcuts and, and everything. Um, but what it has is, of course, the, the kind of energy. And and that was like 30 years of frustration and not behind it. And, and then the enormous feeling of freedom just to be free, just to express whatever I want, go you know wherever I wanted to. Uh, that was... That was the forces that was at play, um, and I so I don't think, you know, uh, I don't think, hi, I don't rate those books highly, but I do rate the project highly. I think as a as a kind of ex, almost experiment, uh, just write an enormously amount of book books very quickly. It was six books it were meant to be two years or one year really. But still, uh, and it was published during the process of when I was writing. But books were published when I was writing uh, throughout the, the, the first year and the second year, really. Uh, so you get all kinds of feedback, and everything changed on the on the way to writing, and and it was yeah, it, it was it was just an experiment, and um, uh, but but. It, It was also the the feeling that this is forbidden. This is I shouldn't do it. Uh, and but I it was the you know fuck you I'm gonna do it. It was that thing also. I just I'm just doing it. And the feeling I, I'm doing it for myself. This is that that was that was it. And I and and the most liberating notion was that this doesn't have to be literature. This doesn't have to be really good. This doesn't have to be you know well crafted in any way. I can just write. Uh, and, and all of that um, you could see, and that created some sort of flow. So I could, I could do thousands of pages in a short amount of time. Um, yeah, must have so. been thrilling. I mean, you know, I know the feelings about. I have the same thing where I look backwards at old work and I have complicated feelings about it. I think that's natural, but to be immersed in a project of that length and to be that productive in that relatively short amount of time must have been a real high like you what were you like <laughs> to be around you must have been so focused or just so entranced by what you were doing it, it was uh, it was um it was it was so it was very different because the first book I wrote, you know, in, in almost in secret, it was this Geir and Geir who read it, but that was it. Uh, and no one knew that I was doing it. And and, it, and I then I had this space where I was safe, you know, and I didn't think of consequences of people reading it or whatever. Um, and then basically also oh, the second book was written in that. That was before publication. And then it was the, the, uh, published, and then uh, the the reaction from the family, uh, my father's family, came. Uh, it was like uh, it was it was uh, it was uh, it was the last thing I wanted, and I and I felt so incredibly bad. It, it was like for me, uh, it was and I want to be you know to be a good person, and I and I obviously wasn't. So it was like torture. And then the public attention, for, for some reason, it completely went crazy in Norway. It really is impossible to understand that it could happen because of a book. But it was, you know, it was TV, it was front page of newspapers and the journalists outside of my friend's buildings. It was like, it was like, it was insane. And there I was, and I was <laughs> writing, you know, at the same time. And I, so I just blocked everything out. And, and I also had, you know, we had three three kids and they were going to nursery and it was it was like a some sort of uh, a combination of inferno in internal inferno and then family life and and trying to get you know things together and 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 then the pressure from from the outside so my my mother and my brother and they were all you know like um, in a storm that I I just shut the door and I didn't do any interviews or you know just just working and 
And my brother said to me, one day I'll show you some of this that's going on that you don't know about. Because I asked him, don't talk about it. Don't mention it. I don't want to know. And, and so, so it's, um, yeah. And, and so it was a lot of help and, and, um, uh, a lot of, uh, anger and hurt feelings and a lot of stuff everywhere because of this, what I was doing. So that was very hard to come on terms with, especially when I was writing. This means I have this um, autistic ability to distance myself from absolutely everything that's going on. I mean, and just do it, uh, what I'm doing. Uh, and that's scary, that's scary, I think. Because it's not, it's almost like I'm, you know, have this side that is, um, yeah, well, have to, have to write, you know. So where does this, like this, this ability of yours to focus, like a couple of things come to mind. First of all, that you seem to work well under pressure or in the presence of pressure from opposing forces. We talked about your desire to have no boundaries and to be completely free in the making of your art but also that you have imposed upon yourself these limitations in terms of ritual and in terms of the kind of language that you use in your writing that helps to liberate you. It's like this tension is freeing for you. And in the writing of the My Struggle Cycle, you're under the most incredible kinds of pressure that most writers never experience. This, you know, this enormous reaction to the book, the am amount of media yeah. attention the controversy. I think a lot of writers hand ring and fret about the consequences of writing autobiographically, particularly as it implicates people in their lives, family members and friends. That's a very common feeling for writers because most of us implicate family and friends on the page one way or another. We write from the stuff of our lives. You, with that particular cycle of books, I feel like experienced the most or you know one of the most extreme versions of that because the book was so widely read and was such a sensation that it brought everything up many levels you could not have been prepared for that no not at all i was the opposite i thought this is a small uh yeah this was to me and and to the publishing house was kind of an experimental novel it was an experimental or ex experiment really in in realistic prose no one had any i mean the first print was like 10,000 which is it's not very little but it's not massive you know it's it's uh, it was the same as my previous books and and yeah so it was it was com came completely out of the blue and all the things that followed have have you know um Instead of having literary readers uh, alongside, they had lawyers, you know, <laughs> it was like, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was a very different kind of experience. But, but still, I don't think, you know, the children, I don't think they noticed really. So it, it wasn't, it wasn't like when I'm telling it now, it sounds like everything is on fire and it's like it's people screaming and, but that was all internal, it was all inside of me. Um, so from the outside, it was kind of, you know, um, yeah, kind of normal. It's just, uh, doing my job basically. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, but it was, it was extreme and it's, it's, uh, it's hard now to just imagine that it actually happened. It sounds like some sort of crazy nightmarish dream, but it, um, and and the the thing is that the the, con, the 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 act for me wasn't a major act. It was a very little act. I, I wrote about myself. I tried to do it kind of straightforward, honestly, and that was it. That was it. And, and nothing kind of could prepare me for 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 the get, getting you know that massive reaction so many readers and that kind of uh, that nothing in and and that it should be transgressive and that it should be you know immoral or it should be because it was only about me I wrote about me 
and 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 so <laughs> and 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 writing a novel is you know an intimate thing and that's the genius of it because it it's intimate for the reader too you know so but we can have many many readers and 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 it all is only one by one um so, so yeah I, I can understand it and explain it but but still it was it was almost like writing a diary it wasn't exactly like it but it was like you know i'm writing and i thought some of the things i'm writing is so specifically about me that it has no value you know and i thought it could have value because it's so extreme uh, you know extremely boring or extremely detailed that it has some sort of you, you, that it goes on the other side and gets some value as, a, as an experiment as i said um but then, when I got readers, they have exactly the same stories. Ex said, this happened, this, exactly the same thing happened to me. And I said, how is that even possible? You know, but it, it's, uh, and I think that's why it, it uh, resonated the book. Because, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a high level of recognition. Uh, and also many things that you don't really talk about, you know. Um, but you can, and I, I had never talked about these things to anyone. Yeah, maybe my brother, but no one else. Uh, and, but I could write it because that's only that's only me and and, and the screen. Um, so yeah, there's many paradoxes in this, but um, but it's history. Yeah, it now. seems like an extreme example <laughs> of the 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 personal, like when you write the personal and you really write deeply into the personal, it ends up being universal, which is sort of counter to one's instincts. You think that you have to say something really grandiose in order to write something that has a universal appeal, but the truth is the exact opposite. <laughs> you yeah, and it's giving the... up. Yeah, it's just giving up the, all the notions of any, you know, the great novel and then, and then um, yeah, that was also, an, uh, yeah, it, it couldn't have been written without that notion tucked away, I think. But I also have to say that there was, at that time, there were many other kind of things that was going on. Um, I remember reading, <clears throat> he was the Swedish writer that my generation in Norway also looked up to. <clears throat> he wrote novels. That was, uh, you know, modernistic in a way, but they were great. Um, and he wrote. Uh, uh, oh, wait, what is his What is his name? Yeah, uh, he's called Stieg Larsson. It's not a crime writer, but another Stieg Larsson. He was really the, you know, the, the, yeah, he was um, he was incredibly influential, and and very good, uh, of course. And he wrote a, a, a kind of a. It's it's uh, labeled as poetry, but it's 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 called Natta de Mina, which means put my my family to bed or something like that. Um, and it, uh, I read it in the nineties, uh, and it had such an impact on me. It was like um, you know when you get completely almost white. Uh, when you <laughs> you read something, because he wrote about real persons, he wrote about real events, uh, all of a sudden, out of no nothing. It was like you know, it was like, like being almost like, yeah, like phys a physical reaction to it. Uh, and that was making that idea of of doing that possible. You know, it was like yeah, that's possible. It wasn't it wasn't possible in Scandinavia in that way before he did it. I think. And then you also have the also Swedish uh, Lars Norén, his uh, playwright. Uh, he wrote diary. He died of Corona just like two years ago. Um, he wrote diaries, uh, published them. So he started have started publish it when I was writing. I remember reading it, and it kind of allowed me to to go on. I can, you know, because it's incredibly the same. It's naming of people and 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 and, and incredibly honest and and it's massive. I think I don't know how many volumes it it ended, but it's if you read it, it's it's an absolutely masterpiece. It's I think it's the one of the best books that have come out of Scandinavia the last thirty forty years. 
it's very very personal very very detailed uh but it's a diary so it's, it's not like uh not trying to be a novel or anything but it's uh you know you can read 50 pages of gardening in it and it's wow you know it's like and then of course you can get bored but it's the thing with diaries they always have this pull and it, it's it's um I can't really explain why, but I have I have always liked reading diaries. It's been like comfort for me, or it has been always something I liked. Uh, I think it's just being close to some someone, some some other soul really uh, that you don't have to deal with. Uh, it's always interesting. But he his 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 books are also just incredibly. Um, they are not influential in any other way that in Sweden at least everybody read it and talked about it and discussed it but it's very much him and, and but it's a major it's a major work so the, his first volume came out I remember when I read it uh, then I've been writing like a few months and I think that gave me kind of a belief or something I can I can deal with it or I could do it yeah, it allowed me to to continue somehow. So let's talk about Wolves of Eternity. And the book itself takes its title from a uh, Russian poet, Marina Sviteva. And there is a line, I believe, in her work, however much you feed a wolf, it always looks to the forest. We are all wolves of the dense forest of eternity. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the origins of this novel? I mean, it seems like you just kind of like I'm curious to know, I guess, from a process standpoint, you work so fast, you sit down, you have nothing to say, but you sit down and you just kind of start writing. And yet you say that you also have some rules that you set up for yourself. I would imagine you set up rules in advance. There's certain music that you decide you're going to listen to while you're writing. Are there certain constraints that you put on your characters or on the narrative itself in terms of how the book is structured. Like, can you just talk about how this new novel or this new novel here in the States anyway, and in the UK, how it originated for you? Yeah. Yeah. It, it originated with, um, a blank page and I needed, you know, I didn't know where to start. So I found this old 30 pages writing that was one thing i had and the other thing i had was that um i had uh i go off and go to foils in london so I just and i don't i never have much time there so i just go and pick randomly books from the philosophy department or whatever and stack them here and and there was one book that i bought uh and then i just started reading it uh it, it, it was by a sociologist called bernstein i think the first name would be something aina bernstein or something it's about russia and it's about um uh really uh the belief um of uh what captured me was a description of a demonstration in Moscow against death, uh, and 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 she she witnessed that, and and uh, so it's uh, it's against aging. They want to stop aging, and they want to stop death. And then she writes more about that movement, and it has roots in nineteenth um, uh, century Russia. So and. Um, uh, There is this weird character called Fyodorov. He was a librarian in Moscow. Uh, he was very ascetic. He had one idea, and that was that all we should resurrect every person that ever been alive. That was his idea. It's a crazy idea. But Dostoevsky was interested in it. Tolstoy was interested in it. And from there, the kind of it it has it, 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 has, it has been a constant kind of current in, in Russian society and Russian culture since uh, I discovered uh, and then I thought okay I have to write about this uh, so then I have this guy in Norway 
19 in the 1980s and I have to bend the story over to Russia how do I do that and and the novel is that bend you know so <laughs> so so the novel leaves after 400 pages this young man uh, and starts up again in Moscow in almost present time uh, with um, a character that is basically more or less the opposite of Sivut. Sivut is very it's not a very complex person. He's very happy and 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 caring. But 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 then this character, she's a woman in her forties. She's called Olive Tina. She's a biologist, um, and that was all I knew. Uh, she's going to be a biologist, uh, and she is single, and she is in Moscow. And then I started to write that, and then you know there is someone in the room. That's her son, maybe. And she goes there. He's Nineteen have been drinking night before. Then there is a father. Maybe something happened. Yeah, he's eighty. They're going there, and that's that's that part of the novel. And then everything comes, you know, through those simple facts. Um, uh, it, it ships. It's, it's all of a sudden it's a life and it's a story, and and there is of course some connection to uh, to the first part, which is the third part of the book, where those two very different parts meets and they also meet first in through Chernobyl the Chernobyl uh, accident in 1986 that comes from you know what's now Ukraine but then it was Soviet Union so that's so, how the novel was structured and I didn't know anything about anything uh, except you know I wanted an essay in there about this uh, Fyodorov uh, person and, and about that idea of resurrection because this series is about really somehow the dream of eternal life or longevity or or everything that's going on now about that has to do with that somehow these novels are circling around that so there are a lot of themes at play in this novel that i feel like you can locate across your body of work the theme of death I mean, you, you write a lot about death. This is something that I feel like everybody, every writer who's worth anything has to be contending with death, right? I mean, it's like, it's, yeah. always, it's always there. It's the yeah. big thing, right? It's the big thing it that is. we're contending with. And then mm. it's also a, very much a novel about family. And you obviously write a lot about family and relation and not only mm. relations between people and between family members but i also think this is a book that's about our relationship to the natural world and our relationship to the cosmos and you mentioned chernobyl in the 1980s this is when you were coming of age i, I just w was curious as i was reading what your experience of that time was like and what your awareness level was when chernobyl melted down i well, my awareness levels weren't, I couldn't, uh, I remember it very well. I couldn't um, put it in perspective, but I remember being scared. And I remember the, the, that the threat was invisible. Uh, and, and the thing with radioactivity, you know, when I was little, I read books about Madame Curie, I read books about all of that, and it's always been some sort of... Um, hellish quality to it and that was kind of uh, I didn't express that then but I felt very I felt that very much with everything that had to do with and it you know was the 80s was a nuclear bomb and and um, and uh, so there was there was this uh, fear that almost uh, I think has some sort of metaphysical quality to it it's the it's the uh, It's the it's it's like the total transgression into something, we sh where we sh we shouldn't go. You know, it's that's the feeling of of nuclear, the whole setup of nuclear bomb and nuclear plants and and when it goes wrong, it, it was the, it was just uh, very scary. I think, I thought or I felt. Uh, and then when I wrote this, I I watched uh, some, yeah. There was some documentary that was 
maybe that was after i don't know but but where you where you saw footage from it was all footage we saw footage from when chernobyl was grounded and and kind of the optimism and 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 also from from inside the factory and you saw those kind of terrible scenes where they have to remove some objects on the floor because they're radioactive they're so highly radioactive they have to go and the people who are commanding the team out there knows those people are going to die but the people who's doing it's young kids they don't know but they are still sent out there and that was on film i was it was uh, yeah but that was a uh, digression uh, well one thing that comes to mind for me as i'm listening to you has to do with the ways in which i could really detect to an unusual degree the intellectual curiosity of of you uh, like as the author on the page in this novel i could really feel your reading in the writing if that makes sense you know there's yeah. references to dostoevsky tolstoy rilke uh you, you mentioned nikolai fyodorov who is this guy who believed that we should be resurrecting all dead people uh virgil heidegger the penguin book of the undead I'm trying to think of see if i'm forgetting anything but it's it's really in there and so when i think about that and then i also think about our conversation around your process and how fast it is you must be yeah. doing research and reading as you're writing like how does it all work you know because you clearly have done a lot of deep reading and thinking and research along with uh, the deep work that it no, not, it. no 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 deep thinking um but but what i what i do i i do like an hour or two reading in the evening maybe an hour mostly uh and it's more and more become um like um, you know non-fiction like popular science in all all kind of ways and everything that really interests me um it took me a long time before I understood that actually I've, I'm allowed to read whatever I, about whatever I want. You don't have to be qualified to to read about it. So, for instance, I read a lot about you know the theories about how life emerged, how life you know come into come into being. Uh, uh, so I'm very curious in my reading. So it's been a lot of biology. That's why she's a biologist, of course. But, I was going to say um, this is Alex yeah. Tina's character. She's an evolutionary biologist. Yeah, she is, and and but I, but I don't take notes, and I don't think about things. My theory is that if it's you know if it's worth something, it will come out in in a way, uh, and then it's like it's everything is fresh and everything is happening on the page. But of course, it is it is uh, whatever you take in, I think comes comes out in a way. Uh, so. Um, and I really try to avoid writing essays, but I, I do like it very much. But I, I think it's, you know, it should be one. So the third book doesn't have any essays, but but this one, I was too tempted to to go in there. But it's, it's very hard to get a grip on those things um, that essay is about without the essayistic form, really. Um, so there, everything I read about. Uh, Russia and, and Russian history, and especially around Fyodorov and, and after and the revolution and stuff. That was uh, that. That was um, then. I read parallel. You know. Then I looked things up and and it. But it is just almost whatever you start to read about. It is fascinating. You know. If you go, if you go there, it is interesting. And the freedom of being a novelist is that, of course, when I discovered I can actually write about whatever I want is is part of this. Um, but then, for the first time in my life, I have had people reading it, uh, like a, like instead of doing research, interviewing people and ask them about their jobs and what they do, I just write what I think they will do, and then I send it to them, and then they correct, or that this would never happen, and so and so that's that's a new thing for me but it's uh, it was especially with russia that was important because i have only been in russia for nine days and this is a whole fucking novel set in in russia so of course there were many things i got wrong did you travel there for like on a research trip to see it and to like take uh, it no I, I i i did i 
did a few years ago. I was there nine days. Uh, I wrote an article for the New York Times. Uh, so I was there with a photographer and a fixer and everything. Uh, I was so great. It was so absolutely wonderful. And I think every bit and piece of information I got on that trip is in the book. Because that I know, I saw it, you know, so then I could, but then I could, you know, that's kind of a, a safe place to be. Uh, and then the rest is probably, you know, Norwegian middle class ish, but uh, but something is authentic in there. So, so for okay, instance, so if you remember, if, if you remember the truck driver, that was an actual, that story was an actual truck driver who told me. So I just, just put it in there. There's some changes, but, but, but the, the, some of the things that happened really happened. Okay, so I know we're coming up on, I think we're over the hour. I want to make sure to ask you a lingering question that I have about process. You mentioned a couple of times that you have your editor read your pages on a daily basis. That seems unique mm. to me to have it, that sort yeah. of process. But it, it makes sense in the context of speed to have somebody... Yeah kind of vetting your work day after day. A question yeah. that I have has has to do with the kind of feedback that you get. Uh, when uh, Gare reads these pages, is he marking them up and then sending them back to you? And then are you correcting them as you go? Like what level of feedback do you get and how much time do you spend in, an, in a kind of self editorial process as a result as you're working? Yeah, well, it's uh, no, it's not marking up anything, and it's not no corrections. It's just um, it's just to, to I think to get the flow going. Uh, so w what he can do, uh, except giving me kind of a um, you know a, 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 a belief that that it has some value somehow, is if I'm stuck, I call him. And we talk about all kind of stuff around it. And when I hang up, I can go back and I can write. And it's it's not like he's he's just he's he's incredibly good at unlocking locked situations in writing. Uh, and he's 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 incredibly good at asking the right questions. He's incredibly good at he gets it and he he's a writer himself and and kind of. Um, yeah, knows what he can throw in there, and 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 that's really the magic. That's having someone who can you can talk to in that way and can give you feedback. And and something is almost like there's something third that happens. You know, it's me and it's him, and then it's and he's incredibly dedicated and and incredibly you know literary and very brilliant. And but it's not like it's never about correction. It's always about finding a way forward. You know, and he's been my editor. He was the one who picked me up from 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 nowhere, and and he has been my editor ever since. I've never had any other editor on my novels than him. So it's like twenty four years now, and and he still is. You know, I remember with my first novel, I called him, had some problems, and he's you know he picked up the phone and they talked, and, and then after ten minutes talking about the novel, he said, I "I'm sorry, but I got to go. I you know I just got a daughter. I was just hope to." get some stuff and I have to go back. That's the kind of the level of dedication for him and literature. What's his number? <laughs> Can I call him? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I know. That's such a such a privilege to have him. And it's, I wouldn't have been a writer without him. And I would never have written my struggle without him. I would never have ever done anything without him because he, you know, it's, um, it's like, uh, yeah, he's a big part of the space I'm writing in. So I believe it was Gear and something that I read as I was preparing for this conversation who said something to the effect of Karlova is like the, the rare writer or the only writer I know who got everything he wanted artistically. Like you've, you know, as a writer, what do you want? You want a readership. Yeah. You want to publish, you want to publish books and make a living writing and you want people to read them and you want to be in conversation with readers. And yeah. you've got that in spades. And that is not, I mean, there, there are, I guess, a, a handful of writers, I would say, that I've spoken with on this show that really have reached a lot of readers, but it's not normal. And I'm curious... No. 
to know how you feel like and to hear you talk about what it's like to actually realize your dream like to realize that ambition it's not a it doesn't fix everything does it <laughs> you know it could be tempting to think no, that it would uh, no uh, it doesn't really because it's always about what's on the page today and 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 nothing helps about uh, the, the the kind of emotions you have uh, towards that i mean you think it's crap you think it's shit there's no doesn't help my um self you know esteem in in any way but it it, it is a very happy thing you know it is you know it is it is everything i could ever have wanted from writing i've got you know i got it and and that's uh, and i'm aware of that's not but i i, I would have been writing without it you know i would have i didn't expect it and i didn't ask for it i i so uh, it's just incredibly lucky lucky with the people you meet lucky with the circumstances lucky with everything and then then that happens and then but i still have to sit down and write crap every day no matter what and i would have done that no matter what so so it's it's kind of anchored in the in the writing and i understood that with my first novel, I come from kind of a literary, literary background in my head. I, I was editing a literary magazine with, with friends and and writing reviews and, and some sort of hardcore, you know, literary person. And, and the worst f for the self-image was sellout, you know, it was commercial. And, and then I wrote my first novel and I was sure my identity was on that side. And it was a commercial success and it was like... It was, um, it was all of a sudden. It was, you know, it was like TV and 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 lots of uh, stuff going on and interviews everywhere in Norway uh, on on that scale and and it and it really fucked me up. I couldn't write afterwards uh, until I found the kind of the reason for writing uh, is writing. It's nothing else. It, it's it's. But then when I found that, I've, I've also found some sort of purpose in it uh i wanted what happened but i but it, that wasn't um the thing that kept me doing it you know and it's very much the same now it's it's uh, it feels when i'm writing it's the external things are just gone it's uh and i can't you know i can't write novels i have to invent it every time which i think every novelist have that situation but then you are completely in despair almost every day you know that doesn't change, even though you have many readers, I think. But yeah, just the fact that people actually read the books and it's actually published. And, you know, I'm, I thought for so many years that I wasn't a writer, or that I couldn't be a writer, or that it was out of reach for me. And then that was the happy moment when my first book was, you know, accepted and published. All right. Well, we talked earlier. I know you're, you've always got like a lot of irons in the fire and you're very busy. You have the Wolves of Eternity publishing in the States and in the UK. There are two more books in this cycle that you have written. And is the cycle, the cycle's not done yet? Or do you feel like the story is complete with this cycle? Or is no, it no, it isn't. No, it isn't. This fourth book was a really long detour it's back to 1996 again so no it will be a, f a couple of more books a couple of more books so that's the next two years for you yeah it is it is all right well it's so impressive and i'm deeply grateful to you for taking the time uh no it was to great talk talking to you me from london uh, really uh, really appreciate it and i wish you all the best with i guess the next couple of books in the cycle thank you very much